Hello. I had an opportunity to speak on Mother's Day. We had some technical difficulty, and yet I was challenged that I do believe that the word that the Lord has put in my heart is a fresh word for today. If you will, give me a few minutes. Let me share something that I believe the Lord is trying to challenge the church with. Let's pray. Precious Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the freedom we have to worship you, to study your word, to hear from you. This morning, I pray that you will open the eyes of our heart, give us ears to hear your word. Let us be challenged, Father, to be more effective and be aware that we have those we're influencing on a daily basis. Will you please, Holy Spirit, guide my thoughts and my words. Let me say what you want me to say, no more, no less. In Jesus' name, amen. If I was going to title this sermon, it would be, Are You Watching? Because They're Watching. Are you watching? Because they're watching. I'll be reading out of Exodus chapter 33 if you want to get your Bible. I wonder, do you remember where you were the morning of 9-11? I would say you probably do. I know I do. I was a fourth grade teacher at a private school down in Covington, Georgia in Conyers area. I was teaching a uh, combined fourth grade class with another teacher and I left my class to go get some print off the copier and as I'm walking through the lobby there is such a commotion the televisions were on and blasting and everybody was glued to the to the screens I asked what was going on they said you know an airplane had crashed and there was fear I walked back to my classroom just in time to find my uh, principal walking in and saying we're on lockdown families are starting to call keep your children contained and they may come by and pick up their child I remember that so vividly I wondered where my children were and they were in their classes being locked down as well you know I now am working at as a senior living home and I'm a director for activities and events and you know there's a lot of forgetfulness in the house but if I ask them where were they on 9-11 it was such a historical moment that these little folks can remember exactly what they were doing and where they were. I dare say right now, you and I will be written down in history books. This graduating class will remember more than anybody else the details of the day that should have been them walking across the stage and receiving a diploma, but instead, how did their graduation get shared? And I'm sorry for that. Graduates, we're so proud of you. But in all actuality, everybody will remember your graduation simply because this is a historical moment. The church is standing on a precipice of uh, uh, an edge of time and I have a question what are we going to do with it are you watching because they are watching if you will let's look at the scripture Exodus chapter 33 beginning in verse 1 then the Lord said to Moses leave this place you and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go to the land I promised you on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. 
Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. Verse five, for the Lord had said to Moses, go tell the Israelites you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Verse seven. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, a pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. I believe this is a very interesting story and I do believe it reflects a lot of what you and I are experiencing today. But for us to completely understand this, you have to go back to chapter 12. Back in chapter 12, you see the plagues. You know, a plague is a reoccurring event. Reoccurring event. And plagues linger, don't they? You know that firsthand nowadays, don't you? The coronavirus is a plague that has impacted not just Georgia, not the United States, but the four corners of the world have been impacted and their culture has absolutely been turned upside down. The people we're talking about here in Exodus were people who in all actuality and in their heart were Egyptian. God had chosen these people. God had sent Moses to come and rescue these people who were in slavery. But you need to understand in chapter 12, you're starting to see the plagues occur and the plagues were brought by God in the Old Testament. And they, they encompassed so many things that showed God's power. But I think you need to also understand the kind of people that Moses was, was trying to rescue. You see, in the original time of slavery and, and, and enslavement, that first original generation was about 430 years from what's happening here earlier. That original generation was taken into captivity. They were taken into a land they did not recognize. They could not speak the language. They did not eat the food. They absolutely wanted to worship God Almighty, and yet they were taken into a very uh, backward kind of society that worshiped gods, and they were anti-God. That generation in their captivity would later grow and marry. They would then have children and their children were raised and all they knew was Egypt. Then they would grow up and they would be married. And now that original generation is grandma and grandpa. You know and I know that our children have a different concept of life. They haven't walked the same paths you and I have experience the same experiences. Uh, when we recall Americana way back when, that's not the same kind of America that they remember today. But when you look at grandma's review of America, we're looking at Mayberry. We're looking at far back, so far that our younger generation just sort of smiles and says, that's grandma, that's her way. The thing is, there was still another generation. And so those grandkids would still have, in the future, another group. Now, great-grandma was the original generation 
and you know each generation tends to have less impact on the previous generations. So by the time Moses steps on the picture, he is honestly relieving a group of Egyptian-hearted uh, Israelites, and God is saying, I want my people to be free. So as God demonstrates his plagues, water changed into blood, frogs infesting, gnats, flies infesting the Egyptians, these Israelites are watching their neighbors. They're watching this happen. They're watching their livestock drop dead. They're watching these Egyptians have boils show up on their skin. They see the hail dem uh, de demolish their homes and, and anything alive out in the field. They see the skies turn black with locusts as they come in and swarm all of the crops. They witness darkness that is so thick they cannot see their hand in front of their face. They watch Egyptians firstborns drop dead. As they get out into the, to the desert, they also witness God Almighty miraculously rescuing them from Pharaoh's great army. And life as they knew it will be changed forever. It's an unprecedented and strange time, but Moses is leading them, and they're trusting that Moses knows what he's talking about. Now, Moses would, as you know the story, would go up onto Mount Sinai where God will give him the Ten Commandments that we still tend to live by even today. It's impacted our culture maybe not as much now, but it has impacted our previous generations and hopefully you and I today. So in chapter 32, one uh, chapter ahead, it's vital that I read this particular verse, verse one. When the people saw that Moses was so long coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who was Moses' brother, and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. You see, the problem is, is that they might have had a leader, but they didn't know him. They didn't trust him yet. And their comfort had been taken away from them because they only knew Egyptian ways. They needed Aaron to go ahead and comfort them with and obvious where their eyes could see God standing in front of them. So they formed a golden calf. Now, it's important that we go back into chapter 33 to bring these points to you. Verse one, then the Lord told Moses, leave this place, you and the people that you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land that I've promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to your descendants and I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hebites, the Jebusites. Go up to the land of milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Why is this put in the word? I believe because God wanted to remind the people and remind Moses that I'm a God of my word. I promised Abraham. I promised his son Isaac, and I promised his grandson Jacob, and all the people, descendants on down, I would be a God of my word. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to move the obstacles out of the way. I'm going to move the Canaanites and all the other tribes out of the way, and I will send you to a land that flows with milk and honey. i got good things ready for you. But because of your hard heart, because of the culture you've allowed inside, the culture that it holds on to your heart and you constantly look back and you constantly need comfort and you constantly reach for, I can't go with you. Question. You've been locked in your house for about eight weeks. Have you reached for the Twinkies and the potato chips and, and uh, ice cream more than you've ever been doing recently? Matter of fact, chances are you've been with bated breath waiting and watching the news to find out when your favorite gym is going to open again to get those extra pounds off. I know, I'm doing the same thing. But we reach for the ice cream and the chips because that's comfort food. 
We ordered pizza. That poor little pizza delivery man delivered me a pizza. He had a mask on, he had gloves on, and he stepped back and he handed it to me as though I had the plague. You know what I'm talking about. We need comfort in this time of coronavirus because our culture, everything you and I know has been turned upside down. My title, as I said, was, Are You Watching? Because They're Watching. Well, I have a question. Did that pizza man see fear in me? Or am I aware of how I'm presenting myself before them? Hebrews 12.1, which is a New Testament scripture, and you and I are a New Testament church, need to be reminded. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Church, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We cannot do this alone. But you know what? I believe there's more in this story that resembles where we're at. If you will, go back to the story and take a look at verse 4. When the people heard the distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord said to the people, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. What is that? Well, see, when they left their homeland, Egypt, and God is promising so much better, the Bible tells us that they pillaged all of Egypt. Egyptians were aching for those Israelites to get out of their country because they had encompassed an unprecedented time of loss. Egypt was devastated because of the Israelites, because of God's people. So they handed to them all their jewelry and they gave it to them to just go. Well, here I had to look up ornaments and it basically meant their, their fine clothing and jewelry. Now, I reminded you in chapter 32 that they brought all their gold together. They made that calf because it was a physical God that they could see. It was something that would comfort them because they didn't know what had happened to Moses. He was up on the mountain. They didn't know him. But here, God told them, you're a stiff-necked people. You're stubborn. You've allowed that culture to hold your heart so tight. And I don't know what to do with you unless you do something different. Now, chances are you have stayed in your house shoes and your sweats day in and day out. Put your hair up in a ponytail and kept on going at the house as you're chasing the kids and washing the dishes. And you should be at the corporate office. But it's closed. Perhaps you've zoomed in for your corporate office and you have just slid a sweater over your pajamas and sat there and worked and answered all the questions that needed to be said. It's a different culture, isn't it? So as you look at this, it's monumental to understand that these, what happened with the Israelites, they realized that God was calling them to something different. And God wanted an open display of uh, being willing to lay down their culture, lay it aside, what they held on so tightly. So they took off their jewelry. They laid aside their fine linen and fine clothes that they had received from Egypt. They had left Egypt behind. That's what God is calling the church to do. You see, I, I'm confident that coming out of the coronavirus pandemic that has impacted the world, the church is not going to look the same. 
every single church across the world has either had to change and adapt if they were going to maintain their parishioners and their loved ones. If they were going to be hands extended, if they were going to be able to minister to their people, it has required them to silo their attention and absolutely begin to become social media outreaches. I know Pastor and I have had a, a challenge, but it's okay. It's okay the change that we've had to go through. It's okay because God is wanting to do something different in the church. Don't forget. Don't hold on to the culture so tightly and forget that God is promising something good for the future. When you go on to verse 7, it says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord, wanting to hear from the Lord, get to know the Lord, petition the Lord, would go out to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Isn't it interesting that God instructed Moses to set it outside because culture was still inside the church. It was still inside the camp. People were still trying to be something that, that God wanted them to leave behind. And so he required that if you really wanted to have time with me, if you truly wanted to, to embrace what I have for you, go out. Separate yourself from the culture that has been holding on to you so tightly. I believe that's what he's calling the church to. So if you go on down to verse 8, it says, And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stood at the entrances to their tents watching Moses until he entered the tent. Have you and I not been watching? Have we not been focusing so tightly on on the TV or the computer or the news that we can get to find out what's happening in the world? On Sundays, have you not been uh, tapping into the social media outreach that your church is, is Facebook Live or Instagram or or Google, whatever. The case is, is that you and I have been trying to get connected to our church, haven't we? It's changed. It's something we've never had to do before. I even know some of our parishioners who've been out on the boat, but they've been at church. That's different. And Moses would go out to the tent of meeting and people would stand at their entrance and watch him. What were they seeing when they watched him? Verse 9, And Moses went to the tent, and the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they would all stand and worship, each at the entrance of his tent. Why is that so significant? Because God knew that the people he had brought out of Egypt needed to be comforted and see his presence. You know, a cloud actually in biblical um, context represents divine presence. See, God was making himself obvious that when the man of God stepped into his presence, though the people weren't so sure of which direction he was taking, though the people weren't so sure of him, they were comforted to know that every time he went in there, the presence of God was there. It was an invite from God for his people because it said if you wanted to inquire of him, if you wanted to know him, if you needed petition of God Almighty, go out, separate yourself from your surroundings, leave the culture behind, and get one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. Tent of meeting was a gathering place outside, away from the distractions. And when Moses went to the tent of meeting, the people would watch, just like you and I, watch online. When the people saw Moses go into the meeting, the tent of meeting, they would all stand and they would worship then. But they were comforted because they could see, physically see, the presence of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I forget. We forget we're New Testament people. We have 
God living in us, the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy 1.14, it says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, God is doing something new and he's expecting us to leave the old culture of church behind. You know why? Because these new generations, these younger generations didn't experience it in the old time like you and I did. But God is requiring us, us, to change so that they will come to know him. It's vital. As you read on, verse 10, whenever the people saw the pillar, of clouds standing at the entrance of the tent they all stood and worshiped they began to learn each at the entrance of his tent verse 11 the lord would speak to moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend then moses would return to the camp but his young aide joshua son of nun did not leave the tent in closing listen to this this coronavirus has thrown the world together. We're all in this together. Moses would go in and talk with God in such an intimate way like we're talking now, friend to friend. And you and I cannot, we don't dare, allow ourselves to forget that others are watching us. Some of you have been able to return to work. They're watching you. They're watching when you and I are standing in the grocery store and there's empty shelves. The meat flies off by the morning hour. They're watching to see if faith is standing in the face of fear. Are they seeing fear in our eyes? People are watching to see if our God that we declare to be so good in good times is still just as good in the bad times. They so badly want it to be true. And we may be the only Jesus they actually witness as we're standing at the bank, as we're reading our bank uh, printout, as they're looking at your Facebook and they see your posts online. Are they seeing faith? Or are we afraid? Can people actually see his divine presence here and here? Are you and I exhibiting it and showing him through our daily living? The last verse is very telling to me. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. I didn't know he was in the tent. Did you know he was in the tent? I didn't realize that there's a boy, very impressionable, younger generation, who even Moses didn't know he would be the future leader of the Jewish people. His culture was completely different. His perspective was completely different. His energy was completely different. Matter of fact, when you read the book of Joshua, it's a violent, impactive, changing, hard book to read. But I'm telling you this, this younger generation that I'm seeing, this newer generation, when they catch glimpse of the divine presence of God, when they truly experience what we used to call old time Pentecost and they experience in a different way the presence of God, there's a tenacity, ladies and gentlemen, that will drive our church, drive the church world where God can use them, where God can impact. You and I are not gonna be able to reach into a, this generation. Uh, it is, it is a foreign land that we're living in, but it's a foreign generation that has come up. Will the church leave the old culture behind and be willing to move forward? Because God is up to something. 
He's got good things for us. A land with milk and honey is what he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because you and I have been grafted into the family, we have been allowed as Gentiles stepping into the Jewish uh, uh, heritage. What a blessing we have as we read his word. And the promises of his word are just as fresh for you and I. But this younger generation are watching us. Will we? Will we leave old culture behind and allow God to do what he plans on doing? I hope this has been a challenge to you because God gave me this particular sermon six months ago. I did not understand. The word coronavirus had never dropped off my lips. I had never had any concept of masks and gloves and, and going into, the, into uh, the public area, standing six feet apart. This is a different culture I'm living in. It's a different culture you're living in, but God is up to something. If we'll just allow him to move forward with us, he wants to take us into something that's so much better than what you and I experience. Will you pray with me? Oh God, I'm so excited about the future. I can't see it. It seems like a fog in front of me. But when I look at your word, that fog is your presence. That cloud is your divine presence. And I desire it. I want to know you better. And God, I don't want to stand in your way. The church is to be something it has never been before. You are, you have not brought this coronavirus by any shape or form. It has been the choices of man, the sin of man that has allowed this to impact the world. But God, you're a God who's good and you will make good things come out of it if we'll allow you to. So I pray now that you'll cause our hearts to be supple and tender towards you that we will leave old culture behind and we'll be willing to move forward in the way you want us to go, the way you want the church to impact because they're watching us. They're needing to know the Lord. Time is so short. Challenge us, Lord. Inspire us like we've never been inspired before. Create in us, Lord, a heart that's willing and excited. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me today. I'm very excited about what the Lord has up for my life and for yours. Are you watching? Because they're watching.